Welcome to the discussion on pneumatic actuators. What I want to do is just introduce them to you, go over a few things. We're not going to get really deep into pneumatic actuators, but I want to kind of give you the bigger general picture of what they're all about. What we're going to do next week is we're actually going to put them into application and look at flow rates or how much air actually volume specifically is being displaced during their actions. Right now, we're gonna actually just gonna, gonna focus on different types of actuators, uh, their specifications and some terminologies and uh, discuss how to select the right kind of actuator. And then we're going to look at like forces and pressures and areas inside the actuators that you know, define how we make them go, how much force, how much pressure we need and stuff like that. So just moving forward, let's just kind of unpack a couple different types of actuators. So what we're going to do is we're going to be focusing on linear actuators. We will get into rotary actuators a little bit later in this course when we actually get into a project where we're going to apply rotary actuators into the project and we'll kind of unpack those a little bit more. But essentially, you can just know that there are two categories of pneumatic actuators. There's a rotary actuator, they go like this, or like this, or sometimes they go like this, back and forth actually. And then there's linear actuators that just go this way and this way in a linear fashion. There are all different types of both rotary actuators and linear actuators, but it's kind of the, the two main categories we can break them down into. Now, as far as the symbols go for the rotary actuators, We've got a bunch of symbols here, and I just want to kind of go over these. I will be going over symbols throughout this whole course. In every lecture, we're going to learn some new symbols. So right now, let's just take a look at the rotary actuator symbols or the motor symbols. Yeah. So rotary actuator in pneumatics, we can also call it a pneumatic motor, but also we call them rotary actuator. So um, you can use either terminology. So here we go. We got our first type of here. It, we call them air motors in one directional, one single shaft. That's it, nice and simple. As you can see here, we've got this little guy over here and that indicates that air is going into the actuator. Air is going into the actuator. We will see this symbol later on where we talk about compressors and pumps where we'll see that arrow going the other way. But for now, we know this is an air motor because the air goes down like this. The air goes in these arrow is pointing in. So in this case, I again, it's one directional because I've only got one arrow down here, but I've got a double shaft. In this case, I've got a bi-directional. I can make this actuator go both ways. But in this case, I've got a double shaft. And then over here, it's a double directional double shaft. Now, we also have rotary actuators that are adjustable. Yeah. And we know that whenever we see a symbol that's that arrow going like this, either if it's in electronics or pneumatics or hydraulics or any discipline, if there's an arrow that indicates with an arrow on it, there's a line with an arrow on it, it indicates that something is adjustable in some way. Now, this one's kind of cool. This is an oscillator down here. And what this does is it doesn't go around in circles. It goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Yeah, pretty cool oscillators. So these are the kind of the air motors or rotary actuators. Again, we will use these in application as we go. Let's jump into linear actuators and take a look at the four different types that we're going to focus on for this course. We've got these four different type of linear actuators. We're going to use all of these in application. So essentially we've got like our basic standard actuator they're gonna be using in the labs. We're actually gonna be using um, two different types of these in the labs. But for now we just have something called a double acting cylinder. And if I put air in one way, it retracts. If I put air in the other, it extends. And I can control both the extension and retraction as far as the force goes and actually even the speed of the extension and the retraction. So in the second one, as we look down below, we go into the double rod cylinder. It's the same application, although they're just two rods. It's pretty cool. It's a bit of a, a more rare bird. You don't see those as much, but there are specific applications where you actually might want two rods. But again, you can control the force very specific in retraction and the force in extension, depending on if you change the pressure. Plus, you can control the speed of the action cylinder moving out and or retracting, or in this case, going one way or the other. Now, the next one is a single acting load return cylinder. In this case, I can control the speed of extension in very slight degree. It all depends on how much force is going back on it. Actually, if there was no load on that cylinder and I put just a small amount of pressurized air in there, it would probably move pretty quickly. 
If I were to put a higher pressure air, it would probably move even more quickly, but there's really no control of the speed. If there's a load on it pushing back, then I can actually control the speed of extension, but that all depends on the type of load. And generally, we don't actually control the speed of a cylinder in extension by somehow, moder somehow moderating or changing or manipulating the flow into the cylinder. Yeah, that's a little weird, but we will get into what's called metering of cylinders a little bit later, how to control their speed. And we do something called metering out in pneumatics. So talk about that totally later. Um, just, you know, just going back to this single load return cylinder, the way it retracts is the load. So if it's picking something up in the air and I pressurize it and it picks something up in the air and then I let the air out of it, it will retract. The speed of retraction will have to do actually with how quickly or if I'm going to throttle the air coming out. So I can actually control the speed of a single load return pneumatic cylinder in retraction more accurately than I can control it in extension. So moving on, we have a single acting spring cylinder, spring return cylinder. And in this case, actually, there are two types of these. One is you can get a spring return and a spring extension cylinder. Yeah, you can actually have a spring on either side of these. So they're both available and you can just order either or and just order one with a spring in retraction or a spring in extension. Now, we will see later on when we calculate forces that the force of the spring has to be taken into consideration. In this case, we have maybe a load that's maybe not as strong as, as we need it to actually retract the cylinder, or maybe we just wanna get the cylinder out of the way really quickly and the load is not actually pushing it fast enough or hard enough to get it out of the way. There are lots of different applications for all of these and we will take a look at those applications as we go through design processes in this course. So moving forward, we'll just take a look at what we call cushioning. Now, I did talk about the speed of these cylinders and the fact that they're extending quickly or slowly, but if they extend really quickly and they just go like bam and they retract really quickly, kind of like this, extension quickly, retraction quickly, that's damaging the cylinder. That, you know, that the piston inside is hitting either side quickly. So that's essentially, you know, damaging it. And after many, many, many cycles, I'm gonna be damaging my cylinder. So if we have an application where a cylinder will either extend quickly or retract quickly, we wanna put in what we call cushioning. And it's essentially just putting kind of like a, an absorber or a shock absorber to deal with that that extra shock that's in there. And um, depending on the application, we can get a cylinder that is maybe only cushioned in extension or retraction. Or in some cases, when we have maybe a flexible manufacturing cycle or some other thing where we're using a pneumatic actuator in different applications, we may wanna have that adjustable. Yeah, we may wanna have our cushioning adjustable. And in that case, we can actually have an adjustable cushioning situation here. Now, there are two types of cushioning. One is adjustable cushioning. That's actually dealing with air. What happens here is that when we actually put a little tiny piston on the end of this larger piston, pardon me, and when that piston goes into here, there's an O-ring in here, it compresses air in here, and then that air is vented out here, but I've got a venting screw or a cushion vent screw that I can adjust the amount of cushioning or adjust the kind of the amount of throttling of that air that is going out of there. If I just let it out really quickly, then there's a lot less cushioning. But if I kind of squeeze it down and I kind of say, no, I'm gonna have to ask you to compress some of that air in there, really push it out, then you're cushioning the cylinder a lot. So it's adjustable and we can have this in extension or retraction either way, but this is adjustable. The other option, like I said earlier, was that we can just get fixed cushioning where there's just a little rubber seal on the inside, inside the piston, that is that shock absorber. Now we can get single cushioning and single cushioning in retraction. We can get double cushioning, one for extension and one for retraction. And we can get adjustable cushioning for just retraction or adjustable cushioning for just extension or adjustable cushioning for both. And there was one I didn't mention here, which is 
cushioning for extension as well. So there are all of these different types of options. You really have to think about the application when you're talking about either double cushioning or single cushioning and retraction and or extension. And essentially, it's all about the application. So in this case, we have a rejection cylinder. There's this conveyor belt. And there are these parts going down the conveyor belt. Maybe there's a vision system looking down and inspecting the parts or some kind of inspector that's inspecting the parts, whether that's a human being or whether that's some type of sensor that says, you know what, that part's not good, it has to be rejected. And what happens is this pneumatic cylinder is actually just gonna extend really quickly. It's gonna kick that thing right, it's gonna boo, it's gonna fly right off the conveyor belt and then down into a tray or a bin or something. And then it's gonna retract right away. So it'll extend right away and retract right away. And what's happening there is that it's putting a lot of stress on the cylinder, bam, bam, right? Just pew, pew. So it wants to get that part off the conveyor really quickly so that it gets out of the way for the next part coming down the line. In this case, we're going to need double cushioning for sure. We're definitely going to want double cushioning. So in this case, we want a single cushioning and essentially uh, a clamping mechanism holds on to a paint can, right? So this guy, again, it, there's a conveyor belt. There's a paint can coming down. When the paint can is detected, a sensor of some type detects, hey, there's a paint can there. Either it actually maybe is a little limit switch, or it could be any kind of sensor, a, a through beam sensor or a retroflective sensor or a capacitive sensor, lots of different kinds of sensors that indicate and tell the controller, hey, there's a paint can here, grab onto it. So the cylinder extends and it's not gonna extend all the way because it's clamping onto something. Yeah, it's grabbing and pushing into something. So it's, it's actually pushing, again, say my hands, the paint can, this is gonna extend and it's just gonna hit my, the paint can, but it won't fully extend. So this isn't happening. So I don't need extension in retraction, but because I've got this thing, this assembly line moving, time is money. I've got to get things moving really quickly. I want to grab onto that paint can really quickly, bam, grab onto it. And then the process does stuff to the paint can, fills it, puts a top on, does a bunch of stuff. And then boom, this thing's got to get out of the way really quickly so that paint can can move on down the line and we can get the next one in. So in this case, we want cushioning just in retraction. Yeah, just in retraction. Now, it could be that I have an adjustable manufacturing plant. Okay. So in this case, what I've got is I've got a flexible manufacturing system. So flexible manufacturing indicates that this manufacturing cell is designed to manufacture maybe two or three or four different parts. Depending on the part, depending on maybe just some changes in that part, we may need to make the cell do just slightly different things. It's not gonna be an entirely different part. Generally, flexible manufacturing is all about just kind of manipulating something a little bit. Even, uh, even if you just go into the, the, the point where uh, a part is coming down and the part is um, either red or blue, that's flexible manufacturing to a very small degree because at some point you're gonna say, hey, you know what, uh, make that thing blue and it adjusts itself and makes it blue or make it green and adjust itself to make it green to the point where we're gonna say, hey, let's make the positive part or let's make the negative part to a certain thing. Lots of different ways that we can adjust a manufacturing system. And in this case, because I've got pneumatic actuators, maybe those actuators are acting differently along the way. And if I've got one time where this actuator has to fully extend and fully retract, then I'm going to want to have cushioning on both sides. It could be that when I adjust to this manufacturing cell, this thing is going to go out and clamp onto something and it won't fully extend, but it needs to fully retract. In that case, I'm going to want cushioning that's adjustable, but only cushioning that's adjustable in my retraction and not my extension. If it's going to do the opposite, then I want something that is adjustable in extension, but not retraction. In this case, the flap sealing process on the largest part, right, so I've got a manufacturing process that's, that's manufacturing different size parts. It'll extend 80% of the stroke, and um, when it's set to manufacture smaller parts, it's actually going to extend all the way. So in this case, I want, at some time, that's going to extend all the way. Sometimes it's not. So in this case, I'm going to want to have uh, adjustable manufact adjustable cushioning on one side, um, in that case, on the extension side, because in some cases it does extend 100%. So all of these situations require you just to sit down and say, hey, you know what? 
I need to think about how this cylinder is going to act. I may need to have adjustable cushioning. I may not need to have adjustable cushioning. And one of the things I just want to say to you is that, you know, if you don't know that you've been asked to design something, or maybe you've been asked to replace a part, in a machine and you don't know exactly how that machine works just ask figure out who it is that's asking you to do the work unless you know the system intimately and you designed it in the first place you know what's going on but a lot of the times we'll actually be going out and like you know maintaining something uh, putting new cylinders in and maybe we're not familiar with that cell or someone asks you to design something and you're like well you know that person is not a designer that person is not an electromechanical engineer that person doesn't really understand the intricacies and they may not give you the full picture you have to be able to say hey you know what I can see understand how pardon me I can see how to build this thing I understand the gaps or I understand the information that I need to know that they didn't give me go ask them and go find out exactly what you need and try and apply the right thing so essentially just to kind of give you a bigger picture about what cushioning is all about if I need this cylinder to extend really quickly, then I'm going to put cushioning here. But in some cases, maybe I don't need it to extend really quickly. So I'm going to put adjustable cushioning. If it is extending and extending and retracting and or really quickly, either way, it's going to damage the cylinder. So adding a little bit of cushioning, which is not a large extra cost, is actually going to save your cylinder a lot. But the thing is, if I put adjustable cushioning, when it gets out, when it fully gets out right near the end, it actually slows down a little bit and you are going to lose a tiny amount of time, like a quarter second. But that is a big deal when you're making thousands of parts during the day. So you have to think about whether you want adjustable cushioning or not, because if you're going to slow a cylinder down and you don't really need to slow it down, you want to change that. Let's jump into different kinds of actuator specifications. I want to tell you all about the parts and the names and stuff that's going on here and actually how they work. So let's get into the, the kind of the mechanisms itself and study how this thing works. So I think you get this. There's a piston inside and that piston has air up against one side or the other and then that creates force that makes this extend and retract. I think you kind of get that. Now, by the way, there are seals in here. Around that piston, there are seals. I think you should go and take a look at, watch some videos on some seals. I'll put some links in Blackboard so you guys can take a look at the seals because I think it's good for you to see a visual about how seals work and maybe watch a video or two about how they actually work and the different types of seals that are available. But I think that's important. But for now, I want to get into how we do the calculations and stuff and what the names of things are. So this is the rod. Okay, I mean, think that makes a lot of sense. That's right. Inside is a piston. It's moving back and forth. This is the cylinder, and these are the ports. Now, in this case, this is a double-acting cylinder. I also have a single-acting cylinder over here. Oops, it ain't it. And I've got this guy. Uh, it's got a spring return on it. So, in this case, I, I mean, I've got a, a double port T on here, but essentially, I just added that. There's one port in the back. By the way, you can get ports on the sides ports on the backs yeah. and uh, you know lots of different kinds of configurations for these things. So the port here is right on the back. Um, let's just say there's one air line going into this thing. If I put pressurized air here in this, we'll extend. Now when it extends, I'll just use this one. If I were to extend this, there's air in here now. When I extend it, air's gotta come out of here. I mean, there's air in here. If I block this air, I won't be able to extend it. So air comes out. This is single acting spring return cylinder, and I will show you that because I will pull it out and let go. It just goes right back. So I don't know, that's maybe two or three or four pounds of force, quite a bit on that spring. It's kind of hurting my fingers just to do that, but that's retracting on its own. But I want to think about extension for this. When I'm extending this, and I'm gonna calculate, say how much force I need to extend it, I have to take into consideration the counter force pushing it back on the spring. So if I needed to apply 40 pounds of force here, and this spring was pushing back with five pounds of force, I would have to put enough pressure in here to make, what did I say, 40 or 30? Let's just pretend I said 30. If I want to put 30 pounds of force in extension, and I've got five pounds pushing back, I have to put enough pressure in here to create 35 pounds of force, because I'm fighting that five. But I wanted to talk about that extension and retraction, the air 
if you can see in here, there's a little tiny hole there. So when this does extend, the air on this side of the piston vents out. And when it retracts, it needs air to go back in there. So it just goes back in here. So there's air going in and out of, in and out of here. Now you can get these things uh, in a really dusty environment. Um, what you can do is you can actually go get a spring return double acting cylinder. And in this case, it's going to have a port here. And then you can put some kind of filter on here or what we call an exhaust port. Yeah, an exhaust port is just got like a high filter on there. The filter is actually just designed to kind of making the exhaust maybe not so loud, but also to block particulates from going in there. So if I had this cylinder and it was a single acting spring return cylinder, and I was using it in a very dusty environment, I'd probably not want to use this because it's just got this just open hole. So a lot of dust can get in there. I'd probably actually go get a double acting spring return cylinder of the same size. And then I would take this port and I would put some filtering on there. I could probably just put an exhaust port on there and I think I'd be okay with that. Okay, so we know over here, taking a look at this slide, we know that I'm gonna generate force by putting pressurized air on this side of the piston. I'm gonna create force on this side by putting pressurized air on this side of the piston. And we've got this diameter of this piston that we're gonna use for our calculations, and that's called the bore diameter. When you buy these things, they come with a bore diameter. On the data sheet, it'll tell you the bore diameter. In this case, I've got this labeled as a three inch stroke and a one and a quarter inch bore diameter. So um, how do I calculate kind of the geometry of these things? Well, I'm, we're gonna see the formula actually use this diameter to calculate the area. We'll get into that in a second. But essentially I need the area of that, that piston so I can calculate the forces because I'll be given a certain pressure or I can work with all of those three attributes. So what we do is we have an area over here and that's the extension area and this area over here is a retraction area and you can see because the rods in the way one is smaller than the other. Yeah, the retraction area is smaller than the extension area. So that's really, it's really enormously important. Like it's very important. If I put a certain pressure in here, a very set pressure, 20 PSI in here, I would get if I put it in here, I would get a force of retraction that was a certain amount. If I put 20 PSI in here, I would get a force of extension that was greater. Yeah, it's greater. Because there's less surface area in here on this side because the rod's in the way. I mean, the air pressure is actually inside here. The air is still pushing on the rod, but it's pushing this way on the rod, right? It's not actually creating any force on the rod going this way or that way. So it counter counterbalances itself. There's no extra force where the area of the rod is. So the, the, the air pressure only has access to this area here, this piston area here. So there's less piston area here. So the force in retraction is less than the force in extension. That's important. So there are different kinds of calculations that we have to do to kind of deal with that. Now, let's talk about this rod. That's the cylinder rod itself. And then I have all different kinds of rod ends that you can put on here. And I'll show you this. Actually, both of these do have a threaded end on them. Okay, we give you a sec. Okay, good. So that's a threaded rod on the end. That's also a threaded rod. They're different sizes because they're different size cylinders. But what we do is we put an end effect on here or some kind of rod end on here. In this case, this one's really cool because it's got like kind of a double pivot on it. Yeah, this is really cool. So there's kind of like a bearing inside here. So any rod that you put through here, this will go on the end of here. Any rod you put through here can pivot in many ways. So if I was grabbing onto, let's say I had a, a mechanism here and I was moving it back and forth and I had a pneumatic cylinder here that was pulling and pushing it. If I'm gonna push this, if I'm gonna, let's start it here. If I'm gonna do this and I'm going to say uh, extend it, right? And it's gonna go like this. You can see that angle in between my hand and here is gonna change. So I need to be able to account for that. If that's only the angle that I'm dealing with, just, just that, it's always, this is always rigid and this is always either going this way or this way and that's it and this is always staying here. Actually, this has to pivot slightly as well. So if that's going like this and this, then what I can use is this type of rod end here, right? I don't need to get too complicated. But if this thing is going like this, and back and forth. If it's not only moving this way, but moving this way or this way as well, like kind of all over the place, 
then I need a different rod end. And that rod end up here has that bearing that can manage that. Now, this rod end as well, as you can see, has a hole through it. So this has the ability to go up and down. Sometimes we have to put a special pivot on here that allows the cylinder not only to go up and down, but to move a little bit this way or that way, right? So this thing as it extends could be making a motion of coming down and moving out. It could be doing, it could be doing this, right? So we need to think about pivoting over here. Mechanisms, I mean, you know, this is a mechanical system, right? So we have to think about the mechanisms here. So let's talk about the stroke and what I call clamping distance. So the clamping distance is important because it's different than the stroke. So let's just kind of take a look at this. Now, the rod diameter is important because we know that we kind of need that for our calculation to figure out how much area there is in retraction. And in extension, all I need is the bore diameter. And this thing kind of goes out and back and forth. And we did talk about applications where it goes out all the way and back all the way. That's called the stroke. So the distance the cylinder moves or the distance the cylinder can move, like from here to here, it's called the stroke. That's it, the stroke. That's the stroke distance. It doesn't specifically mean that that is going to be the distance it moves during operation, but that is the stroke. So when you buy this thing, this thing has a three inch stroke. It's got a three inch stroke. So from here, so if I were to measure the distance from here to there, right, that's exactly three inches. That is the stroke. Now, let's talk a little bit about the rod travel, right? So the rod travel is this. It goes in and out. But when we talk about rod travel, we're talking about the application itself. Not all the time does the cylinder fully extend and fully retract. Remember I was talking about that application where I was grabbing onto a paint can? It doesn't extend all the way. It just goes out to here and grabs on the paint can. If it actually went all the way and grabbed onto the paint can, it wouldn't actually be clamping onto it. It needs that little extra. So what we do is we retract it a bit and put the paint can here and make sure that it doesn't go to the full extent of its stroke to clamp onto that paint can. So in this case, the rod travel is less than the stroke. So they're not always the same, and that's important. Let's take a look at clamping distance. Clamping distance is going to be the rod travel. So the rod travel, pardon me, let me say this again. The rod travel, the rod travel is either the full extension, or it could be just half or a little bit of it. It's however the however far the cylinder moves during operation. And the reason that's actually important is because in the next lecture, we're gonna be talking about how much volume is displaced during an operation. And that's important because that helps us choose a, a compressor and actually know how much air we need to run our system. Okay, good. So the clamping distance is the distance that the cylinder moves to clamp onto something. Again, if we're trying to clamp onto something, we don't want to have this cylinder move all the way to clamp onto a paint can because it's not actually going to be applying any force anymore because once it goes all the way, there's no more force. It, it's stopped. So I want to have it clamp onto something and not go all the way so it's actually still pushing onto it and holding it. So the clamping distance is also going to be the rod travel because that is how far it travels during an operation. Clamping distance is important. So you have to think about these things because later on in design, you're going to have to calculate how much air these things need to run. And that has to do with how far they go. Good. So again, let's take a look at the rod travel here where we have a full extension. In this case, this cylinder or this cylinder on the page here is designed to fully extend and fully retract during its operation. This is a drop table. So again, this may be dropping parts that are either no good or they're done or whatever they have to do. Oh, there's that one part that we have to send off to the next the next part, the next place or the next conveyor or whatever. And this thing goes down and it comes up again, down and comes up. And this is designed, this, this cylinder on here is designed so that it fully extends and fully retracts. So in this case, the rod travel is the full stroke of the cylinder. So we can see that, you know, it all depends on the application itself. Okay, now let's actually get into some calculations about area and force, and we'll throw some pressure in there too, because that really matters. To calculate the area, we're gonna use pi r squared, but not. I mean, you can use pi r squared if you want, but I have another formula here that will help you because when you get these cylinders, 
they're rated in the board diameter. I mean, you can take the board diameter and then put that number in your calculator and divide it by two, and then you get your radius, and then you can use pi r squared. But what we do in pneumatics is actually we use pi d squared by four. Yeah, and if you take a look at the math over here, it, I can say pi r squared or pi d squared by four because essentially what's going on is that I, if I wanted the radius, I would take the diameter and square it by, I mean, I divide it by two, pardon me. And then if I just took the diameter and squared it, then I'd have to divide it by four, not by two. Does that make sense? Because essentially four, two squared is four. So I'm just gonna take the rod diameter, I'm gonna divide it by four instead of two and multiply that by pi. And, and there you go. So um, that is going to be the area. Now, what we have to do is we have to take a look at what the force and the pressure and the area are and how they're all linked. And essentially force is pressure times area. Now, so if I knew I needed a specific amount of force to extend this cylinder and I knew the bore diameter, then I could calculate the area, the extension area, and then I would know the pressure I need to put in here to apply a certain amount of force. Or if I just knew the pressure and I was using a very specific pressure and I knew this diameter, I could calculate the force. And also the other way around is if I actually knew how much force I needed and knew how much pressure I was working with, I could go calculate what bore diameter I needed. And actually you'll find that you can't get the exact bore diameter. You might say, I need a 3.27489 inch diameter bore not going to get one like that right so you go for a three or a three and a quarter inch bore and then you have to adjust the pressure a little bit so that that force you need is going to be exactly what you need so we're going to do some math and we're going to kind of look at this formula and another one that's a little bit a little bit more complicated but takes into consideration the rod diameter and we'll be able to kind of wheel all of these things together the force the pressure and the bore diameter and kind of if we know two we can calculate the third so in this case um we we you know we, the force of extension okay is going to be the pressure times the area and in this case the diameter of the bore of uh, sub d sub uh, d sub uh, capital b uh, squared that's going to be the diameter of the bore divided by four and that's the area so pressure times area force is pressure times area that's the formula now in this case what we've got is we've got something a little different and that we have to take into consideration the rod diameter so i'm dealing with a smaller area and the formula to calculate the area is just this it's pi d of the bore times d of the rod squared like d of the board squared, sorry, minus d of the board squared. I'll say that again. d of the board squared minus d of the rod squared, the diameter, and divide it by four, uh, and then multiply that by pi. So essentially, I mean, if you want to, if you want to do the math, you can calculate that here. But that is the formula that you need to use. Now this gets maybe a little more complicated if we needed to calculate our board diameter or our rod diameter, what we needed. But it's just a matter of algebra and rearranging the formulas, right? That is the formula for retraction. So the force of retraction, okay, sub capital R is the pressure, whatever the pressure is, the application pressure that we're putting in here, uh, times this information here. So um, yeah, there, there you go. Just put that in just another formula. And I think it just makes sense. If you really need to stop and wrap your head around this a little bit, that's fine. But I think it makes sense. It's just geometry, right? No big deal. Just geometry. Okay, let's go in and take a look at some application. So the next few slides are essentially just all about application. So I'm just going to kind of fly through these because they're just examples. You can look at them yourself. I don't have to walk you through this specifically. But there is one I kind of want to stop and pause on. But Let's just take a look at this. Okay, so extension force example. I need to know the force of extension. I'm gonna take my formula for that, which is in the previous slide, and I'm just gonna fill it out. So in this case, I've got a two inch diameter, and my rod diameter is 0.75, but I'm calculating extension. So I don't actually need this value. I'm just gonna do 80 PSI, because we're given 80 PSI, because that's what the gauge reads. I'll say that again. The gauge, reads 80 psi this is not absolute pressure we have studied the difference between gauge pressure and absolute pressure we are using the gauge pressure here because essentially what's going on is that on the other side here even if this is just open to the air 
there's 14.7 PSI A on this side. And if I had, let's say, 100 PSI here, PSI G, I'd have 100 PSI G here, but that's 114.7 PSI A, which is, it will counteract this. Essentially, what I just need to tell you is when you're doing calculation for forces, whether those forces are vacuum forces or they are forces for pressurized air in extension, we use the differential pressure. We use the pressure between the air in the atmosphere and the air in the line that's going down there, and that's called gauge pressure. Gauge pressure is a differential pressure. It tells you the difference between the air in the system and the air in the atmosphere. It's very important. So moving forward, we know we're going to use gauge pressure, and it says here that we've got 80 PSI gauge pressure. So we're just gonna do the math, and it's pretty simple. Make sure you put your units in and all your formulations and all the rest of it. So 80 PSI pounds per square inch, times pi, and then this is important that you do two, uh, for mathematical documentation, you have to indicate that two is squared and the inches is squared, because in the end, actually, you know, I need, because if I if I have inch squared here, this inch squared has to be an inch squared to cancel out that inch squared, so I need inches squared. You have to be able to do the math with the units. You have to square the value and the unit. Yeah, because it's diameter squared. The diameter is not two, it's two inches. So it's two inches squared. Yeah, do the math with the units. So in this case, I've got 521 pounds. Therefore, when a cylinder with a bore diameter of two inches has 80 PSI of pressure applied, the extension force is 251 pounds. There you go. So now let's just take a look at this guy over here. What we have is we've got a spring. Now this is no longer a double acting cylinder, but guess what? It doesn't matter. I mean, in the last example, the extension, the extension, the, the rod didn't really matter. We didn't put it in to the formulation and we're not thinking about the retraction force. We're just thinking about the extension force. In this case, because I have a spring in here, I have to actually put that into the formula, but the formula hasn't really changed. It's just a two-step process. I don't even have a formula over here for this process. I'm just kind of making a point of subtracting. So I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna calculate, if I put 80 PSI in here, it's the exact same example as before. If I put 80 PSI here on a two inch diameter, then this guy is gonna extend uh, with a force of 251 pounds. Although my spring is pushing back. Yeah, so it's pushing back with a certain amount of force. So if it's a 10 pound force, right? The, retraction, the spring retraction force is 10 pounds then I have to take that into consideration. It's therefore my extension force, because I need this to maybe push something, or I need it to clamp onto something, or I need it to open a door or close a door, let's say. It's pushing something, and mechanically, I know I need a very specific amount of force. If I were need to need a force of 241 pounds, then 80 PSI would work perfectly, because I know that the spring in here, let's use this one, the spring in here is pushing back you have to consider that. So just make sure you do that. And if you're working this backwards, if you say, hey, I need 141 pounds of force, this thing, and I know my bore diameter is two, and I know my retraction force is 10 pounds of force, then what pressure do I need? Yeah, just rearrange it and, and solve from there. Okay, let's take a look at a couple other examples and kind of fly through these because it's just a matter of rearranging the formulas. Here we go, we need a force of retraction, okay? So we have my formula, I'm just gonna stick it in because I've also got 80 PSI and I'm dealing with a two inch cylinder and a 0 0.7, um, 0.75 diameter rod. So therefore, I'm just gonna put the math in. Now, if you want, you can put this formula out here. Again, I'm just, I'm talking about doing the math properly, proper mathematical documentation. You have to show that that inch gets squared. These values get squared as well if you wanted, you could put two inches squared, 0.75 inches squared, and leave that out. But, you know, you can do math with the units. Put it outside. Anyway, there you go. So, in retraction, is 216 pounds. Oh, it's less. Yeah, because that rod's in the way. Before, in extension, with the exact same cylinder, with 80 PSI, we had 251 in extension. In this case, we've got less. Yeah. So it's important that you, you know, understand that there's going to be less retraction force. And for some reason, if that's the force that's important because you're maybe pulling something and you need to pull it with an exact amount of force, 
then you need to understand that the rod's in the way and the area is a little bit less. Okay, good. So here we go. Extension pressure example. So in this case, I'm just saying, hey, I have the need for 251. Oh yeah, we're using the same value. Mm -hmm. It's okay. I need the value of 251 pounds of force in extension. And I know I've got a two inch bore. Well, what do I do? Well, I just, just do rearrange the formula for pressure. No big deal. Do that first, please. Rearrange the formula first for the unknown first, please. They get all excited about that. Dude, mathematical documentation is so important, especially for any engineering discipline. So there you go. Uh, and throw in your numbers and you get ADPSI exactly. Over here, the exact same thing. I'm just going to rearrange my formula and I'm going to say, hey, for retraction, if I need a particular force of 261 pounds of force, then I'm just going to rearrange it and figure out the pressure. And in this case, my pressure is going to be 80 PSI. Same thing again. Now here, I guess the formula rearranging gets a little bit more difficult. Dude, it's just basic algebra. You should be able to rearrange a formula to the unknown first. Yeah. So in this case, I need to select a bore diameter. So I'm given particular specifications. I'm like, hey, you know what? You need a certain force. And this is the pressure you're working with. Go and figure out, go and select the right cylinder, right? So you're going to have to rearrange the formula to calculate the bore diameter. And you do that and you say, hey, I need a bore diameter of two inches. And you go, oh, I can order that. Now, in this case, it worked out perfectly. But sometimes, like if I wanted a, a force of 250 pounds or 275 pounds or 300 pounds or 182 pounds or whatever it is, then you have to work with the pressure that you have but then you're going to calculate a diameter that's some exact value. Again, like I said, 2.3478 or some other value that I had. But you're not going to find a cylinder that's exactly like that. You're going to find a 2.2 and a quarter inch cylinder or two and a half or a two or whatever. Um, just adjust the pressure slightly. You're going to have to put a pressure regulator in there. Oh, yeah, we'll talk about those a little bit later. But you can change the pressure slightly so that you can get the exact force you need. In this case, the formula is a little bit more arranging in that you've got this situation here where you're, you have to calculate the rod diameter and then you have to find out what the rod is going to be. Right? So you say, hey, I need, a, I need a cylinder with a two inch bore, but I needed rod to be a little smaller, a little larger. Um, and then you can go and select that. So again, rearrange the formula. I put some colored brackets in here to help you wrap your head around the rearranging. You should be able to rearrange any formula in any way. So it's just algebra. And that's it. Thank you for watching. This is all you need to know about actuators. You need to know how to calculate all of the stuff, that the mechanisms and the, the geometry and the physics of this thing. You have to understand the applications and how to apply them and whether you need cushioning one way or the other. And also you have to understand that there's this spring in here and sometimes that gets in the way. And then next week, what we're going to do is we're going to look at how much, how much air is displaced during these operations, because then we can calculate a flow rate required to make this thing go for a certain amount of time. That's it. Thanks very much. Okay, bye. Plus, you have to understand kind of how to, app, how to apply them. Understand.